Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar Skill Mix for Health Systems Resilience. How can innovations foster integrated care? This brings together three extremely important elements. Number four, number one, resilience. We've all seen that during the COVID-19 crisis, some of our health system had really struggled. Either it was the governance or the health workforce, or we had problems with finance. Um, they have struggled and we, we understand that we need to strengthen the resilience. And of course, the second element here is the health workforce and the skill mix. The health workforce is so important, whether it is administering the vaccines, whether it is reacting in hospitals, shifting around, being very agile, moving from task to task. And uh, finally, we think we know that we cannot move on like this. We need to change things. We need to introduce new measures, um, new ways of um, caring for people, and therefore we need um, innovation. That is why we have uh, termed it today, skill mix for health system resilience. How can innovations foster integrated care? Today, we are resuming the OPS webinar um, a series after the summer break. It's a new season and uh, as you can already see, it's focusing on resilience. How can we make our health system withstand the smaller and larger external shocks, whether it is a virus, whether it is a financial crisis, whether it is aging. And we have lined up uh, in the coming weeks a number of very important topics. One is governance, of course. What are the policies that make health systems more resilience? How do we, what sort of leadership is needed? Um, how do we coordinate across levels, across government? And of course, how can evidence support uh, policy making and governance? We will also have a mini series on aging, not just about the demography, but also about the options for financing and uh, health care for an aging population and also the politics around um, aging. We will have um, a webinar on European funding. What are actually the instruments with what the European Commission is supporting health system reforms in countries? And that will be a very special uh, webinar because it will be linked to the informal um, uh, minister meeting. And then we will have um, a webinar on uh, the genomics uh, regulating the unknown. As many of you know, in 2018, the EU General Data Protection Regulation has transformed the way genomic data is processed and it will have impact on research, on delivery, delivery on clinical practice. So very, very important. And there are plenty more of topics uh, lined up this year. So, as you may remember, the old series started almost a year ago, and uh, we started with um, COVID-19 responses. We wanted to understand what are the most adequate strategies actually to respond to the first, second, third wave and all the different aspects, whether it is the governance, the hospitals, the primary care or the purchase. And uh, then we moved slowly into build back better thinking about you know what are the elements actually that need to need to change what can we do better in the future and now we are here um, with the resilience topic the webinars will um, take place every tuesday from 12 to 1 just one hour and uh, as before we will have short keynote and then a spotlight speakers zooming in on particular topic. And we start with skill mix and the health workforce because it's the year of the health worker. And this session today is a bit of a teaser because there's more to come. We're also planning bigger events at the end of the year. And the focus here today, of course, will be on primary care and chronic care. And when we talk about the health workforce and skill mix, Please let me introduce two things. First of all, where do we start actually in this discussion? From our point, we need to start really with the patient needs. It needs to be patient-centered when we talk about skill mix. We need to think about what do the patient need. And we are talking uh, about an increasingly chronic, uh, increasing number of uh, patients inflicted with chronic diseases, very often with multiple uh, disorders. So what sort of model of care do these people and patient needs and what tasks and roles need to be conducted in these models of care and finally which professions can do the job 
best and more efficient. And as you can see from this sequence, we are starting with a patient and ending with a profession. It is rather needs driven and not supply driven. And if you recollect some of the political discussion in your country, probably you know that you always start with the profession. Talking about skill mix for health system resilience, what are, can we expect? I think there's more out than you would think. There's, for example, new dedicated prevention roles. We have seen skill mix to empower patient and caregivers to make sure that self-management takes place, that health literacy is, is a, can be taken for granted, and that informal carers are supported. We have seen the patient navigator, which will actually be the topic for um, next week's webinar. We have seen nurses, pharmacists, but also um, physiotherapists in new and advanced roles. And probably some of you have seen those also during the COVID-19. I was, for example, vaccinated by a, by a, midwife, by a midwife. And um, uh, finally, we will also talk about multidisciplinary teams, teams, you know, that address the really complex care needs of patients. Now, today we have lined up two excellent speakers. First of all, Juliane Winkelmann from Technical University Berlin. She will deliver the keynote. Juliana is a researcher and she has been involved in skill mix research for quite a while. Actually, the evidence um, which will be presented to her today in her um, keynote, she has, she has uh, researched and worked very hard on it. And she has just submitted uh, a policy brief, the manuscript of a policy brief on this particular topic. And the policy brief will be available later this year. Second, uh, we are very happy to have today Sharon Spooner from the University of Manchester with us. Sharon is actually not only a researcher, but she's also a GP, and she's here today with us in her dual role as a clinical worker, but also, of course, as a fine researcher. And I think uh, that's really excellent. Sharon can bring together these two worlds, the research world and the world of clinical practice. Before we start, just a couple of housekeeping notes. First of all, please use the chat for questions, comments, ideas, but also if you want to share a certain publication or something, use the chat. Second, um, this session will be recorded and we will make it very lightly edited, um, available on our YouTube channel very soon. And last but not least, um, right after the end of the session, you will receive an evaluation form and we would be very grateful if you could take the time, it's, it's very quick, very short, uh, fill in the evaluation, that is a very valuable uh, feedback for us, how to further develop the webinar series. Now, that's about it for introducing today's uh, webinar. And now I would say, um, Erica, Erica Richards, my colleague, um, would you please uh, start with the poll before we have the keynote? Yes, thank you very much, Matthias. So just uh, as a bit of audience interaction, so we can get an idea of who you are and what your interests are, we're just doing a quick uh, poll for you. So the first question is, is integrated care back on the agenda in your country? I know that COVID has really dominated uh, health policy, but is integrated care now back on the agenda? And the second question is, what new skill mix models are in place for strengthening integrated care in your country? So working in multiple disciplinary teams, extending roles for nurses or pharmacists or other health workers, um, uh, new roles for health workers, such as in health promotion, enlisting patient navigators, or indeed none of the above. So really interested to um, hear your feedback and I'll let you know the results of the poll after Juliana has presented her findings. Thank you very much. I'm always tempted to uh, check the boxes in the poll, but unfortunately as facilitator, I cannot do it for technical reasons. So <laughs> quite curious to see what the situation is and how you see that we are going back to um, health systems reforms to build back better and to have more resilient health systems. Juliana, that's now your, your moment. I'll like to give you the floor, please uh, fill us in on uh, skill mix reforms and integrated care. Thank you, Matthias, for the introduction. So I will talk, um, as Matthias mentioned, on um, how uh, skill mix innovations can be a driver for integrated care. Um, 
Um, just to give you an overview what um, how I prepared my presentation, I will give a short definition of what is integrated care. Most of you will be aware of it, but just to bring everybody on the same page, and then I will go to the still mix innovations. What do we understand and it is uh, still mix innovations? And um, after this, I will have a short overview of our work, which we have done uh, here at the department to study on the impact of um, filmics innovations. And I will particularly look at um, the impact on patients with chronic diseases and multiplicity. And then I'll go to the more practical uh, level and um, describe what different types of filmics innovations do exist. Have we identified um, in um, work and, and I will provide some case studies or practice examples of integrated care and service innovations um, in chronic care and care for multi patients with multimorbidity to show um, success stories on how service innovations were key for integrated care. And then last but not least, I will um, highlight some barriers and facilitators for um, implementation of service interventions to foster integrated care. What are what is integrated care? Um, I mean, just to give put it in a broad context, uh, due to demographic change, aging populations, the number of patients with chronic uh, decisions, conditions and multimorbidity are increasing. Um, um, and these uh, so patients' uh, patients' needs are changing. But on the contrary, contrary to contrast to this, um, Healthcare system are still um, the service provision is still fragmented. Solo practices is the most dominant um, type of service provision in many countries, um, um, and and the different providers across the different uh, care levels are uh, fragmented um, and um, not really centered on the needs of individual patients. So in the last 20, 30 years, um, in many countries, integrated care models different uh, forms to address um, to better address patients' need, needs have evolved um, and um, the, under and we can classify them under the umbrella term integrated care. So what is integrated care? It's no real um, or no um, um, uh, definition which um, there are many definitions and it's, there's no um, uh, definition which is used um, that uh, like one the only definition, so I could provide one, two here, and integrate care is a management and delivery of health services such that people can receive at the continuum of health services, um, treatment, diagnosis, long-term care, rehabilitation, for all kinds of uh, services through different levels and sites of care. And another definition um, says that um, integrated care are structured efforts to provide coordinated, pro proactive, person-centered, multidisciplinary, Care by two or more um, care providers across or within uh, sectors. So these are um, a bit similar, but um, strange uh, focus on different aspects. So, but, um, first, I mean, continuum of care is important. First, and um, different providers um, working together. Um, what they, um, so, integrated care can, can come in very different forms as disease management programs, as and trans, uh, transitional care as um, collaborative care. So they, they can be many terms, uh, many terms are used to describe integrated care, but all of them have in co common the triple aim of integrated care. This is which is improved health outcomes for a population, improved experience for people, families, and carers, and better cost effective, effectiveness. And some researchers have added a um, uh, fourth aim, which is. Um, better working experiences of um, providers and clinicians. Um, so as you probably already have seen, um, changing working um, modes, modes, working um, ways of working um, are uh, crucial in integrated care. And um, there, this is where skill mix innovations come in. And um, in many integrated care models, skill mix innovations are a central part. Um, so what, um, so what just to um, give the definition, what are the SILMIX uh, changes? There are changes to skills, competences, and roles and paths within and across health professionals and workers. And they can involve um, also community workers and lay persons and involve teams or, um, or at least two professions. So SILMIX have in, in our 
disruptive and um, they try to improve health outcomes or have a, 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 a positive effects on access for education experience or costs. So, um, clinical innovations have um, evolved due to changing patient needs. More um, chronic patients need a more complex um, care, um, more coordination of care, but they have also evolved uh, due to a shortage of healthcare professionals, lack of GPs, uh, nurses that need to take, um, to take over certain tasks from GPs, and the evolving integrated care models. So, all these um, Changes require new ways of working uh, um, by, uh, from health professionals. They require more flexible uh, approaches of working and, of course, competences to um, uh, to uh, plan care with the patients, to uh, enable self-management, to work in a team, um, to to have to build up mutual, um, mutual trust, etc. Um, and as I mentioned, many systemics innovations have integration at their core. Um, they try to um, improve coordination of care and, and, and improve continuous care. Um, and many integrated care programs yeah, have this systemics innovations in, 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 in a major, major, major component of, of um, um, implementation. Health workers are often considered as true, the true integrators because they're Creating relationships and they're they are the drivers of, of, of integrated care models. And um, as Matthias mentioned, the COVID nineteen pandemic has, of course, um, um, shown that new ways of working are uh, required to build resilient health systems to to enable um, the health health workforce to build to be resilient and to adapt to new situations as. Um, as was um, the COVID, uh, pandemic, where a lot of task shifting between um, health professionals took place. As I mentioned, I will just briefly give an overview of um, evidence which we have collected in a comprehensive overview of review um, on skill mix innovation in chronic care. We have looked at 78 uh, systematic reviews. I just give a very, very brief. Um, of, of what we found, and we have this, uh, we have divided this by the different uh, professionals. So, what we found is that uh, pharmacist, pharmacist led uh, interventions, systemic interventions, uh, had showed a significant improvement of certain health outcomes. Um, for example, the um, uh, pharmacist took on um, patient counseling and this improved the medication adherence. Uh, looking at nurse led care, there were um, they showed some improved but also more or less equivalent health outcomes compared to usual care. Um, there were no improved health outcomes for, for example, nurse led collaborative care found in those reviews we have looked at. And there was not sufficient evidence on nurses in expanded role. Um, we also looked at other professions like uh, navigators or um, community workers. There was an um, improvement of self report health and patient satisfaction. Um, but also mixed evidence and um, looking at team-based care, um, what is was uh, most striking was an uh, improvement um, on depression outcomes, patient satisfaction, and medication adherence for patients with mental health issues. In regard to um, health outcomes, so um, reduction of uh, so resource use, um, such as um, um, attendance to emergency departments, hospitalizations, there is rather limited evidence in those reviews we looked at. Um, um, and also mix very mixed evidence. Um, so just um, we'll, we'll go now to to um, the, the real topic and to describe what are and um, which which type of systemic innovation do exist. Um, and we we can um, distinguish between three different types of systemic uh, interventions uh, innovations. The first one is reallocation of tasks. This means um, um, nurses, which are uh, or professionals, which um, are, exist already, they take over certain tasks. Um, from, for example, nurses take over tasks from physicians, in terms of uh, screening or um, prescribing. So examples are, for example, nurse-led prescribing, um, um, nurse-led transitional care, um, also called task shift, sh task shifting. Like systemic innovation is um, the adding of new roles or tasks. So, um, um, 
new professional roles are created or um, uh, professionals take over tasks which have not been, which were not, not existed um, before. Um, where a typical example is the player coordination function or case manager. And last but not least, um, the introduction of um, teamwork, multi professional care is um, the way that um, more, at least two professions are working together. This can take various different forms, like transitional care teams, uh, GPs working with a, a multidisciplinary team, etc. So taking these, ex these um, very generic um, typology of different studies innovation, I will take this now to the and apply this to um, chronic um, multi-morbidity. Um, so we have, and then I will give examples, um, practice examples from different countries for each of these um, innovations. So we have the reallocation of tasks to nurses uh, that manage patients with chronic conditions. This is the most dominant um, type of um, skill innovation and um, task shifting um, or in, in chronic care. The second type um, relates to the introduction of new roles such as case coordinators or case managers, which are um, crucial when it comes in for integrated care programs and for, um, for managing um, patients with um, and, uh, and, and, this, and identi identifying the needs of patients with chronic disease and that's of that with these um, multi-professional teams. Um, and what is important here is that um, three types of systemic innovations can be often be found in very different combinations with, with each other. So for multi professional teams work together to build care coordinators, et cetera. So uh, it's not always easy to clearly define uh, this systemic innovation system, this type of um, this type of um, innovation. Um, Going uh, now to practice examples, um, the allocation uh, of tasks um, within integrated care. So, as I mentioned, um, exist, uh, the roles of um, existing professionals are extended, um, and professional, professionals manage um, chronic conditions in primary care settings under varying levels of physician oversight. Examples are nurse, -led, nurse -led delivered care, nurse prescribers. Nurse led transitional care and pharmacists and nurse led screenings or nurse led clinics. And one example I want to uh, draw attention to is the uh, um, uh, new model practice with enhanced nursing in Rolls in Slovenia. Um, they, um, so GP practices were, um, were provided um, uh, nurses um, to manage uh, chronic patients and to reduce the burden and workload of GPs. And they followed the new care protocols. And they had a regular exchange um, with the GPs to closely monitor exchange on, on, on the, uh, of the patients. This is um, an example of an um, extended role for nurses in primary care. Um, a second example is um, the introduction of um, supplementary roles with an integrated care. So new roles at the interface of hospitals and primary or hospital and social care. And they often arrange and develop um, care, um, care plans for patients um, and they support um, patients with uh, self-management. Known example are, as I mentioned, core care coordinators and um, more different terms are used as a traditional care coordinator. Um, very two um, practice examples from um, um, the proactive primary care approach for Freight Italy, the new profit approach is an integrated care program in the Netherlands. It's, it's used, um, based on nurse led screening and case management for Freight Italy. So nurses go um, to the file of um, the state, um, patient um, set of, of the GP and see which um, patient is at risk of um, hospital admission and they then identify it together with the GP and go to the home of the Freight Italy to to um, trans transit from reactive to proactive, proactive elderly care. And they meet regularly with GP and other professionals to assess um, to make the care, care and patient care plan. Another example is the Kaiser Plus program from Germany. It's a bit similar and it also relies on the case manager that has less the element of the multi uh, the team meetings. Um, the case manager coordinates health and social care and um, also to prevent hospital admissions. 
Um, both um, the care examples have in common that the case manager, the nurses have a, a, a special training in, in uh, Germany. They have a two year specialized training at um, university level. Um, so these are um, yeah, very um, good, good examples for new, new adding new roles. And last but not least, um, using teamwork and collaboration. And um, I think this is very, very, um, yeah, very common um, skill mix information um, that many professionals from different um, areas and sectors work together. They organize and coordinate the social services to meet the patient's needs. And um, this allows for a complex set of interventions um, because there are so many um, skills and, 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 and knowledge in, in these teams. Um, one example um, of which I would just briefly mention is the practice of great care teams in Manchester and in the UK. Um, there, they have, there's, the city has created a, this kind of these teams that are, are made of GP social workers practice and community health pract um, practitioners um, to identify high risk um, uh, patients and they then do this assessment and um, plan together the, um, the care of these patients and have regular meetings once a month. The aim is also here to uh, reduce unnecessary hospital stays. So you see there are um, the, the, the different elements which I've presented before are coming together in these um, different examples. Um, so coming now um, to what actually is important when um, we talk about systemics innovation um, to to to, uh, to to be enabled and then to further drive uh, integrated care. We have um, identified six, six um, broad um, domains where um, um, where uh, action and and uh, needed at the macro level and the regulation of professions and um, crucial, such as the scope of, of practice laws and the competency standards to really define the different. Um, Responsibilities and, and skills um, and, and um, of, of the health professionals. Um, financing is equally important, um, not only to finance training and um, new trainings, but also to incentivize um, uh, to um, people, uh, professionals to collaborate and also to compensate, for example, um, new professions um, to provide services. For example, in Finland, uh, nurse prescriber didn't prescribers didn't receive sufficient um, compensation to actually pay for their um, for the um, for their um, authorization at the major level, and of course, training is important and uh, continued um, at the major level. Um, existing st uh, structure, IT, IT systems, but also um, skill mix within the existing health workforce are um, this is a, a deciding factor um, for uh, fostering and uh, skill mix innovation. Um, at the micro level, um, what is here important is the um, um, meetings, regular team meetings, communication across health professionals, uh, shared values, and joint understanding of and agreement of coordinated roles. So um, we can see here a lot of um, different factors which are important to enable systemic innovations um, um, across the different uh, levels and which all have to play and which are all interrelated and have to have to um, 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 yeah, and play. Um, so finally, I just want to um, conclude with this um, slide. Um, what is um, needed and what needs to be considered beyond these factors which I just pre presented? Um, this um, design and implementation of still mix innovation need to be population needs based, and the, and this informs the workforce and educational planning. Um, conditions have to be met. And, uh, as described before, political long-term commitment, leadership, and uh, regulation, education, education, etc. Um, and implementation is complex; has to be taken place, has to take place at several levels. It, and, and importantly, it needs to be local because local context matters. And last but not least, evaluation is um, important really to demonstrate the effectiveness of uh, skill mix innovation and to inform back and um, for to uh, service design and planning. Uh, other contexts. I think my time is over. And just yeah, briefly to, to um, 
given your idea of what's coming and um, what the, the, the publication I've just mentioned in, in November this year, um, the volume on film observation, effectiveness, and implementation edited by Claudia Meyer is going to be um, to uh, pu be published uh, soon, and three policy briefs are going to be available also end of the year. Juliane, thank you so much. I think that was the perfect presentation for starting our skill mix and health workforce activity this year. And as I said, today and uh, next week is a bit more of a teaser and we will have more intense um, uh, webinars and events later this year. But thank you so much for this. You, you started with a concept on integrated care and what skill mix actually is. You provided an overview on the on the evidence on uh, certain skill mix reform. You gave examples and uh, last but not least, and I think that is very important. You also addressed the implementation issue because it uh, very often has um, shown that the implementation is a particular tricky um, thing. And I think uh, the way you presented it, make it made it already clear that you need to work at different levels uh, at the same time to make sure that implementation is um, really successful. One of the things which I found particularly striking was the overview on the evidence and to see that against the triple the triple aim, you know, you may be very, the, the intervention demonstrate to be very effective in terms of patient outcomes, but when it comes to the health systems outcomes, either um, there's limited evidence because there are not enough uh, studies or it's a bit mixed because some say it makes it uh, cheaper, more efficient. Some say it makes it maybe a little bit more expensive and so on. So it's also it's not just that the innovations do everything cheaper. You know, I think in some cases it is also an investment, actually, you know, and uh, to have uh, to have the better outcomes. But I think that is something we can leave for later for the discussion. Otherwise, thank you so much. And now I would like to ask Erica to present us the results of the poll. Hello there. Yes. Uh, Annalisa, if you could put the results up on the screen. Um, interestingly, yes, integrated care is very much back on the agenda um, for uh, most of the people uh, who responded to the poll. Um, although maybe, you know, as much as a third um, it's it's still it's still not quite there yet. By far, the most common uh, new skill mix models that are in place are working in multidisciplinary teams and extending roles for nurses or pharmacists. Um, but you know, new roles for health workers in areas such as health promotion is also you know creeping up. Patient navigators, much more of a minority thing. In fact, just as common as none of the above. So that's going to be quite interesting for next week, I think. Very, very interesting, much. Erica. It's almost a little bit helpful to see that people uh, make the experience in countries that care integration and skill mixes back on the political agenda, which would be very important for resilience. So, great. That's the moment where I would like to uh, reintroduce uh, Sharon. Sharon, please, the floor is all yours. Give us your, your input from England. We have to be careful, not the UK, from England. Thank you very much for the chance to speak to all of you and thank you to Juliana for a very comprehensive review of multiple aspects of, of this topic. Um, what I want to talk to you today about are lessons that we learned from a study that we carried out in Skillmix uh, in five practices in England. Clearly the global context of Skillmix in primary care settings is very varied some of you may be aware of this paper, um, showing that there's large international variation in primary care team composition. The structures are quite different in some countries, some are having single-handed practices while others are large multi-professional groups. And there's no uniform relationship between skill mix and urban or rural practice location. The social demographic composition of practice population does seem to be related to diversity in the workforce and the level of organisation that is present at primary care, in primary care at national level is also related to team composition. The context in England uh, is, is the one that I would like to talk to you about today. In principle, primary care services are that first point of contact in the healthcare system, the kind of front door for the NHS. It does officially include general practice as well as community, pharmacy, dental, optometry services, Really, what we want to look at at the moment are those structures in general practice. 
For the most part, services in the UK are provided by independent GP practices who work under contract to the NHS to deliver care for their registered patient population. The workforce has got several different sorts of people, clearly clinical, managerial and administrative. The GPs, general practitioners, lead clinical care and some have responsibility for the business operations as well. GPs, useful reminders sometimes, are doctors. They have broad generalist skills that are in delivering comprehensive healthcare to all patients you know, across all settings in their practices. Clinical care is also provided by nurses, advanced nurses, advanced clinical practitioners, pharmacists, physician associates, and physiotherapists. And, and these, these are, there are many names that are used in different places uh, to describe these workers. The drivers of change for workforce competition in UK general practice kind of follow the spectrum from what creates the problem, to how can we go about dealing with it, what are the actual solutions. Clearly, a rising workload puts pressure on a decreasing workforce of GPs. Health policy has looked at how to resolve this, um, but also to meet the initiatives around innovation and integration of healthcare. In part, we looked at things in the UK as having a kind of a surplus of certain allied health professionals, particularly pharmacists, where in plentiful supply at one stage, um, but also more recently, new funding has been made available to recruit additional members of the primary care workforce. So all of this kind of comes together as a, as a package to increase the number and diversity of practitioners working in GP practices. What is needed to deliver integrated care in general practice? Uh, Juliana has covered a lot of these um, and clearly a lot has to happen at organisational level with flexible cooperation between service providers and organisations, enablers of interdisciplinary and inter-organisational care. And these are things that happen at a different level to, to what was at the focus of our study. Practitioner level action includes clearly communication across the interfaces, um, patient-centred intervention, and in particular, I want to talk about effective interdisciplinary working. The practices that go on when skill mix is implemented in general practice. So th this is the title of our study. It was quite a large study looking at lots of things. In this arm of the study, we did an in-depth case study of implementation of skill mix in five different GP practices across England. And we were funded by the NIHR Health Service and Delivery Research Programme to do that. So the aspects of implementation of skill mix with potential impact on provision of integrated care, I think I've, I've identified three that I think are worth looking at in a little more detail. The first is bringing in an additional workforce to contribute to providing that care. The second is understanding what they can do. And the third is understanding what actually helps them to do it. There has been an increase in the total full-time equivalent general practice workforce in England, as you can see, over a period of five years, 2015 to 2020. The right uh, lines show that the number of GPs has, it has slightly decreased. Um, GP partners are those who have responsibility for business things and, and they have slightly declined, but the number of salary GPs who are basically GPs with the same qualifications, but employed rather than running the business, they have increased. Bottom left, the nursing roles have changed slightly. We've seen an increase in the number of nurse practitioners. In the UK, these are generally nurses who are trained to a higher level, able to do some diagnostic work as well as treatment and many other tasks. And of particular interest is the breakdown in the smaller numbers, but very changing um, trends with the, the uh, employment of pharmacists, physiotherapists, physician associates, paramedics in particular, looking more prominent as the time progresses. Having the people there is one thing, understanding what they can do is something else. And, and one of the, the key things that we found was that you really need to have things running smoothly to get the most benefit from it. So starting with how the patient presents their problem, this needs to happen in a way that allows you to categorize the problem 
according to the criteria that you can then allocate a suitable appointment with a suitable practitioner. So you need to understand the problem. You need also then to have a good knowledge of what each practitioner can do, their various skills and so on. You need then to have appointments available with those practitioners. And clearly in a stressed system, sometimes these things are quite difficult to achieve. But if you manage it, the successful consultation can then produce an appropriately integrated patient-centered consultation. This can involve all the things that, that we know need to go in there, health promotion, protection, uh, disease pre uh, prevention, as well as all the diagnostic and right through to rehabilitation and palliative care. It doesn't always work because sometimes there's more than one problem. Sometimes communication is unclear. Sometimes the problems are very sensitive so patients don't really feel like mentioning them up front. Sometimes it doesn't work before there's, because there's misunderstanding about which practitioners can deal with which problems because each nurse practitioner doesn't necessarily have the same competencies. They've come through different training routes. Sometimes they're, they've been through upskilling and that has given them new skills. So you might find that they're seeing problems that are really not taking greatest advantage of their more advanced training. And, and appointment availability is, of course, often under stress uh, and unacceptable time frame for that appointment needs to be found. When it comes to understanding what facilitates these practitioners in delivering integrated care, I picked out just five points. One, they need adequate resources. You can start with training, but they also need time and they need access to the sort of support and advice from colleagues appropriate to their level of training and expertise. Time is also needed to build trust between clinicians. And, and this is one thing that we're looking at in the UK at the moment, because the, the new practitioner funding that is coming in generally has those practitioners working across more than one practice where things may be done differently and where they spend little time. So it's particularly important that they get to know the colleagues they're going to be working with, so that they have confidence in each other's ability and, and are able to transfer work between themselves confidently. Communication and collaboration is clearly something that doesn't happen by accident. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of understanding as to what the roles of the other people that you're communicating with might be. Careers generally do not stay still. They develop and this can benefit from peer support, from upskilling, as we've mentioned, but also from mentoring of people who are in a similar career path. And finally, as Juliana also mentioned, evaluation is important, monitoring the outcomes for quality improvement, which applies, of course, to integrated care as well as everything else. So that's really all I wanted to pick out. Very happy, obviously, to answer some questions and talk about it further. Sharon, thank you so much for this insight from your research and from your clinical practice. Actually, it was very interesting to see uh, what's happening there, there on the ground. When I saw your second last slide, you know, about the skills actually needed, you know, at the, at the shop uh, floor level, about the communication, the de development, the evaluation. But you also had trust, you know, and I was wondering, is trust also a skill you can actually develop how to, to establish it? But I leave this for the discussion and the debate. We have still 15 minutes time. And uh, Juliana, please come on board. And Erica, it's now time to present the um, input from our audience. Please, Erica. Hello there. Yes, we've had some quite interesting discussions in the chat box about uh, the role of the coordinator and who should the coordinator really be? And with, if you've got a co care coordinator, um, what's the role for the GP? in all of this and how much is it is this a skill mix solution or something else so that's quite an interesting issue another uh Pia Vrachka also one of in the audience also highlighted how um long covid is a new pressure for integrated care and um and for potentially skill mix and multidisciplinary teams so if you've got any insights on looking after people with long covid that would be really interesting And then a third, a third issue, sort of on, in a more general um, sense, is um, is the aim of 
skill mix solutions to encourage more rational utilization and conserve you know scarce resources or is it about providing better quality care does skill mix actually save money and resources or is that not actually the, the key aim of it so that's a hard question you don't have to answer very, that. very good question thank you so much eric uh, shall we start with you juliana and then uh, sharon just pick out the first one you would like and then uh, we can move on yeah, uh, I'll start. Um, so who is the coordinator has taken on the coordinator role and, and how is working then working with the GP is not the replacement of the GP. I think um, I mean, in many cases nurses with special training are um, do, are doing performing the coordinator or the case managing role and, and they are taking up as um, tasks which are usually not done by GPs, which is uh, to accompany patients in their care process of um, getting better or a transition, transition from hospital to their home um, care setting. And they try to educate and, and uh, enhance um, self-function by patients in the long run, um, process, um, which the GP doesn't always have the time. And uh, this is consulting um, with the care coordinator to look at um, the medical needs of the patients. And of course, it's still involved. But uh, and this is probably going to the going to the um, last question of the is it for rational provision of care. I think still with innovation, um, the first aim is to provide more patient-centered care, as, as Matthias mentioned at the beginning. So really taking, um, looking at all the complex needs and the complex um, requirements, the social environment um, of the patient has, so in, in, including informal care, including um, social services um, applications and all the different aspects which need to be considered uh, when a patient, for, for example, moves from um, hospital care to, to, to the home care. And it's very complex and um, GPs do not often have most do not often have time to do this, and uh, that's where um, the new roles um, um, come in. Um, it's complementary to the work of, of GPs in most cases when it's all, uh, taken up and um, accepted by all uh, providers and health professionals. Juliana, thank you so much. And I think it's also a challenge for some of the health systems because in primary care in some countries we have. Uh, GPs working single-handedly and without any support of a nurse or somebody, and then they don't even have the skills and uh, um, having here somebody new who's doing a little bit of the coordination would be certainly quite an innovation in, in those um, uh, systems, like here, for example, in, in Belgium. Thank you so much. Sharon. I just wanted to pick up on the question about the role for the family doctor and what, what that actually looks like. It's our impression that that has been changing quite a lot. Um, we have some teams in the UK which are really quite, if you like, depleted in the, the number of GPs that they've got working there at the moment. And so lots of other people are taking on a lot of the work. But I think the difficulty is that a lot of practitioners who come in who are not GPs, they are not trained and not equipped provide the full range of services that patients require. So that means that whereas in the past the, any problem could be presented to the GP and the GP would have the training, the background, the experience and know how to deal with that, whether treating in the practice or whether referring on to someone else who's a specialist. But what happens now is that the patient sees a different practitioner first. If that practitioner cannot fully deal with the problem, then there's going to have to be another consultation of some sort. It may be done by giving advice and support, but sometimes it means that there has to be a different appointment with, for example, a GP. So in a way, we've stepped back from having that total flexibility of one person doing everything, having lots of different people doing parts of what they did. Um, you need to have then another system in the background that is in some way flexible. So, so what often happens, is that a patient may present with one problem but it turns into three and a couple of those problems the practitioner they're seeing may not be able to resolve so so it then becomes an issue of what well how do we do with it clearly the patient is presenting with the problem and it would be great if they could get some answers at the same appointment 
But if the GPs are fully occupied in seeing their own patient list, then they're not very available. So what we saw in practice was that if the practice is able to organize the GP's time such that the other practitioners can get access to their advice, support, whatever they, whatever they need, um, at the same time as they're seeing the patient, then that gives you that flexibility. So in a way, you're, you're replacing the flexibility of the person who sees everything with the flexibility within the system that allows you to deal with everything, but in a different way. The, the, the difficulty is that that means that there is less time for the GPs to be seeing patients. The, the general idea is that the GPs should be seeing patients with more complex conditions, which arguably will take more time to deal with and, and more of their thinking resources and, and possibly following up on results and, and lots of things. Um, so, so they're going to have to work differently. Um, but not all systems are making that transition a rate that is comfortable for those who are working there. So, so it really means that you're, you're asking your GPs to be different in how they work, almost more like hospital consultants, if you like, because they, they clearly they work with a team and everything is referred back to them that needs to be, but they're not necessarily seeing every patient. That's just, just one aspect of it. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, just one aspect of it. Sharon, thank you so much. And I think that it demonstrates um, that this discussion, you know, who's the right one to have this coordinating role and for what actually is a very important uh, discussion. And I'm actually quite glad that we have next week's um, uh, webinar on the patient navigator and we will take your input into this uh, session to, to further discuss this. Erica, which were the other questions? Shall we go back to the COVID question or shall we go back more to the economics question? Well, there's the COVID question. There are also a couple more questions that have come up in the chat box. Yes. Which 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 you can pick pick a mix, decide. So one is on uh, the evaluation of skill mix. How can it be done? So any top tips on monitoring and evaluation for skill mix innovation? And uh, our colleagues in the OECD have asked about, quite understandably, about payment systems and whether payment systems to providers such as GPs help or hinder skill mix um, innovation. Um, and then also, uh, can integrated care system uh, programs ever be sufficiently flexible to meet the full complexity of patient needs when we're looking at sort of multimorbidity? And this is a question for me because it's the question I'm often asked. Um, when it comes to patient-centered care, what if the patients want to see a doctor, not a nurse? Okay. Can we have relatively short um, responses that we have a third round as well? Juliane, please. Just in the last question, I think it's uh, building trust and confidence and um, the question on, on if, if why patients probably don't want to see the nurse to, to, to solve their problems. It's, um, it's yeah, communication on the different roles among patients. Um, I know in the US it is uh, really well, quite well accepted to go to a nurse, nurse practitioner instead of a GP to be to become a uh, First consultation, and so I think it's um, a question of mindset, change of mindset, which might be more difficult than in other places. Um, and uh, talking about payment systems, uh, there needs to be change um, of payment systems, uh, otherwise, the skill mix innovations will probably not be um, uh, fostered and, and scaled up. Um, the example from Finland and Subscribers were not um, paid sufficiently to acquire their authorization to actually do the prescribing, or to um, their need to be uh, adapted fee for service um, um, payment systems to reduce um, um, other types of health professionals than um, to, to provide their services. And um, this is really um, over to you, Sharon. Thanks, thanks, Juliana. I think that is one of the reasons why implementation is so important. Uh, if the money is not following the, the new skills and the new tasks, you know, then maybe the new skills and new tasks will never come really to the forefront and be as, uh, as useful as they ought to be. Sharon, please. Yeah, if I could just pick up on the evaluation side of things. So this has been part, in a way, of, of our wider study. Um, we have looked at how work competition is associated with things like 
patient satisfaction with prescribing patterns, with referral patterns, um, and, and hospital visiting and so on, um, but also GP satisfaction. And we found a really mixed picture. We're, we're, we're still bringing this to publication, so it's a case of watch this space, um, but basically it's quite complicated. Um, and and some, of it, some of it is quite clear um, that patients, to pick up on Erica's point, patients do sometimes want to see a particular practitioner. And I don't think it's necessarily that they want to see a GP, they want to see the person they've been seeing before that they've built up a relationship with. And, and I think that certainly in the UK is something that, that GPs themselves and, and practice as a whole have really valued those relationships that go on for a long period of time and seeing one generation after another. Um, that, that is something that is very difficult to produce in a, in a system that is becoming populated by more and more practitioners um, and actually becoming quite difficult to access because of the sheer pressure of, of workload. I noticed someone, someone mentioned that I didn't mention COVID. Our field work took place prior to COVID. So, so it wasn't really a major feature of, of what we were looking at. But having gone back to uh, speak to some of the practitioners afterwards, just as a kind of postscript to the study, we found that they were working in really very different ways. And, and, and like the, the commenter said, that they were using technology in ways that they had never used it before. Um, some were happy with some of it. Some were very unhappy with a lot of it. Um, so I think it's, it's something that we need to be working through over the next several months and possibly years. Thank you so much, Sharon. And uh, I think we are now coming close to, to the end of our session. And um, Juliana, that would be the moment where you could sum up uh, in a couple of words, you know, uh, today's topic. As, as we said, this is a bit of a teaser. We are starting a whole host of activities around the health workforce and skill mix and later the year, not only next week, but later the year, we will have more webinars and activities. Juliana, please. Yeah, thank you. I mean, just briefly to sum up, um, I think what we have shown today was that still makes you know, different groups of ways of working of health professionals are a useful ways to drive new um, to, to respond to the changing needs of our um, population and of changing need of the health systems, and um, eventually also to change the service provision in the long term and um, the long run um, to more. Um, uh, yeah, adapted um, ways of, of how to how we organize care and um, ideally this would be service provision which is more integrated um, and uh, clearly it ensures that our health systems um, can be more um, patient centered um, but we may, must make sure to take the patients with us with them and, and to accept the new skills. Um, and the change has to be at various uh, levels, at the system level and down to the patient uh, level and professional level. Glorious. Thank you so much, Juliana. It was a bit difficult to hear, but what I what I grasp is I think that you made very clear that if you talk about integrated care, you need to talk also about the health workforce and the skill mix it takes and how to implement this and with the payment mechanisms and all the regulatory um, context of it. And that we need to think in a slightly more holistic way about these um, um, uh, uh, reforms. So thank you so much, everybody. Annalisa, could you show the final slide? Um, very nice resuming with you together today, um, our new season of the OPS webinars. And as I said earlier in the introduction, we um, now resume our Tuesday habit, so to say from 12 to three Central European, uh, from 12 to one Central European time. Uh, every Tuesday and uh, next week we will have a webinar on the patient navigator. Thank you for joining and we hope to see you back next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.